Okay, thanks for a nice introduction, and it has been a great honor to be the last speaker for this three days conference. So, the subject that I want to talk about today is rather simple. That is how to make a stuff, because manufacturing is rather difficult. So, I'm trained as a chemical engineer, and what we are going to do in industry is try to make sure that large industrial facility sites like this one can work smoothly so they can produce tons of different chemicals every day. And those chemicals, those compounds, will be manufactured, will be processed by techniques known as machining or inject moldings to the end products for each consumers. And this kind of massive production scheme, the scenario, has been a legacy of from Henry Ford, and it has been able to enhance the productivity of our human society. However, this system is not perfect. You see, after we massively produce a certain products, we need to find a place to store them. We need to find a way to ship those products to the, to the end users. And uh, the most uh, unpleasant thing is that every consumer will get the exactly same products, which might not be able to meet their specific needs. So how can we approve this? Can we make the manufacturer even smarter than this? That's why in recent years, people are focused on a new technique called additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing. So, so basically, for 3D printing, what a consumer needs to do is to build a 3D model in their own computers. And they are software to slice those 3D models into numbers of layers and program them into a number of, of codes. And a 3D printer will follow the codes so they can deposit those ink in a correct position to form 2D patterns and eventually build those 2D patterns layer by layers to form 3D structures. And in recent years, this technique has been a rather robust one uh, because this 3D printer here is probably the cheapest instrument in our lab. So basically, every consumer can buy one in their own house. It is quite amazing because it can act like a small robot to do its thing, to manufacture your design materials by itself. And in the slides on the drive, you can, you can, show, you can see uh, a product or a final project from a class I taught last year about 3D printing. This is one of the final projects from my student that uh, he want to have a model for a protein called collagen. You can see 3D printing can offer very high, high definition and very fine details. Because we can precise the complex surface structures of those proteins, we can also see a small molecules dug in the central values of these special proteins. And in a traditional manufacturing process, you need to negotiate with the factory so they can produce a model for you. The whole process can be very time consuming and also very expensive. However, with the 3D printing, the whole process can be done in one afternoon and in a very reasonable price, especially for graduate students. So, but today's talk is not really about 3D printing, not really about the printer, but actually about what kind of ink can be 3D printed. So I think most people will share the same experience with me that we use a traditional 2D printer to print out our daily database documents. But when the time comes, we need, we need to replace the ink cartridge, then we start to realize that, wow, those ink are really, really expensive. Sometimes they are more expensive than the printer itself. Partly it is because of the marketing strategy of the printer companies, but it also demonstrates how important a good ink is. And uh, this is exactly the point where we can play with some chemistries. And uh, the most common ink for 3D printers are polymers. They can be in the form of filaments in a spool or the precursors of those polymers. Right now, we are using some very simple polymers like polyelectric acid or polystyrene. But for me, also trained as a polymer chemist, I find those polymers rather boring. And these days, when, we peop when people hear about polymers, what they have in mind is, is probably a vision like this, plastic waste. Uh, plastic waste is also part of the side products from the mass production scheme that we discussed earlier. And those polymers are not let the polymer become plastic waste because they, we prepare them from petroleum-based materials. We prepare them from oil. So there is no bacteria, there is no natural process to degrade them in the environments. And for those polymers, they were intentionally designed so they can be degraded. 
they are not strong enough for most of the applications. So how can we solve this problem? In our lab, we are trying to learn something from nature. So there's an actual term called so-called biopolymers. I think most people probably know that our body is composed by more than 70% of water and some organic compounds. But if you ask me, I would say that our body is being kept alive by those biopolymers. We use DNA to storage uh, genetic information. We use protein to act as an enzyme to make lots of difficult chemical reactions to happen. We also use polysaccharides in the form of uh, sugar to store energy. Plants use polysaccharides in the form of cellulose to provide a strong mechanical support. And I find those biopolymers are really an amazing materials because nature only uses uh, only a few number of building blocks. But by arranging those building blocks in a very special patient, a pa pattern, they can uh, create a high order structures. They can achieve even more functions than what we can do with the synthetic polymers. Let's take an example. So the, uh, this is one of the most famous tree in our campus. If I haven't Look at it. If you haven't visited this tree, please do. But uh, what we want to do is that we will need to dissect the structure of this plant. So you can see inside the cell wall, there are tons of different fibers. And those fibers are highly stacked structures of a biopolymer known as cellulose. And uh, recent years, people have found that those cellulose fibers sometimes lie even stronger in mechanical property than steel. But at the same time, they are lighter, they are biodegradable, and we can prepare them from renewable resources like uh, this tree in here. And uh, besides synthesizing those amazing biopolymers, nature also finds another way to use them. Because Mother Nature is a stingy woman. He, she wants to use the same elements every, over and over again until it finds a better design. So let's take a look for another good example, this bamboo. Bamboo is also quite popular plant in Taiwan. And uh, most people probably recognize bamboo as a pretty resilient material. If you dissect the structure of bamboo, you will find that bamboo also uses cellulose nanofibers to uh, provide high mechanical support. But unlike most of plants which, which will disperse those fibers homogeneously or uniformly inside their structures, bamboo decides to focus more on the outer shells. Because that's exactly the place where you will, uh, it was subject to the most highest mechanical deformation under strong wind. And by utilizing this kind of effective design, bamboo can use much less materials with, to achieve the same or even better mechanical properties. And this is exactly why bamboo can grow faster and grow higher than most of the plants. The problem is this kind of highly graded structures it's very difficult to be achieved by traditional manufacturing techniques. That's why we need to use 3D printing, because this kind of structure might be, able, might be an easy case for uh, 3D printers. So our lab uh, wants to combine these two kinds of subjects together, smart manufacturing and uh, sustainable feed stocks. And what we want to see whether we can have some uh, new applications emerge from the combination of the two. Right now, we are investigating applications for those two combinations for tough electrolytes, so they can be used for energy storage device or air sensors. Uh, we're also investigating some applications in engineering, engineering plastics or materials for biomedical applications. But the science I'm showing here is probably just a five to 10 years short-term goal for our lab. Eventually, for my own career, I want to see whether we can give more freedom to the designer and the researchers around the world. So right now, we only stop at commercially available materials. Whether we can give more freedom to designers so that we can actually start with the design of small molecules. Whether we can start with the shoes or the, uh, or the design of polymer architectures, polymer, different biopolymer libraries in combination with the property evaluation, property prediction, and then finally, additive manufacturing. Maybe we can make the design in the future more meaningful. And uh, this will, of course, require multidisciplinary work, and it will be a very challenging mission. But I think with our current experience with smart manufacturing, and with the gift from modern nature's million years of evolution, we should be able to add an even high-impact design in the future. 
And in the end, I would, I would like to thank the Ministry of, of Science and Technology in Taiwan, National Chengkou University, and our department for their research and the financial support. And also, I would like to thank all the graduate students. Some of them are hiding in the back of this room to, for, because they took great courage to, uh, to enter my lab in the, in the first years. And uh, I would like to thank all the audience for your attention for these 10 minutes. Thanks.